Hi guys, it's Matt just doing the edit here and I just wanted to let you know that Justin had a few audio issues. He is based in Mexico and we had to fight a dodgy internet plus a dodgy microphone. Um, anyway, we hope you enjoy the show. I'm Tass Mellis of The Starters. This is Ben Golver with the Open Floor Podcast. Hi, I'm Kristen Ludlow from NBA Inside Stuff. I'm OG Ananobi of the Toronto Raptors. Hey, I'm Elena Donon and welcome to the Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch. Double Clutch, Double Clutch Podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Double Clutch NBA podcast. I'm one of your usual hosts, who's not actually been here for a while. <laughs> I'm Matt Wellington. I'm joined tonight once again by Mike Miller. Hello. And we've got Justin Quinn all the way from the other side of the pond. Hello. hello. How, how's everybody doing on this uh, fine Thursday evening or afternoon, should I say, in uh, in New Mexico? Uh, not too bad. No, I'm in old Mexico, my friend. Old Mexico. Whoa, okay. New Mexico City, not not New Mexico, the state in the States. We'll get that back someday. <laughs> <laughs> Along with California. Yes, why not? <laughs> Trump will be building um, some walls. Or, uh, we, we probably shouldn't get into building walls and kind of things. We like breaking down walls here. We're all friendly over in over in, uh, over in in the UK. <laughs> uh, what, what are we now? Like 13 days removed from Brexit? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, we, yeah we, we, <laughs> let's just not even go there. <laughs> What's that? We don't need to talk about that anymore. <laughs> we had enough of the jokes at the um, at the BAFTAs and everything else that, you know, all the directors were making jokes and Brad Pitt was making a joke about us being single and stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, man. So, We've got plenty of basketball to be talking about anyway. There's been there's been Indeed. so much going on, and it's that it's that point of the year where certainly we notice as a as a like a as a website, you know, it, it it tones down a bit. People become a bit less interested in the lead up to sort of the All Star break, and then afterwards, um, it's cool that you have the break. I think because it does bring people back in, and you get a little bit of fun and excitement. Although we might get onto that later about how some of us aren't very. Um, excited by that uh, judging by a quick conversation before we started the podcast but um yeah the all-star breaks obviously this weekend it's a nice time to chill out that is in chicago um and it's always on tv over here which is a another bonus and a benefit if you if you are watching and it's, it's something to keep you away from your partner on valentine's weekend should i say <laughs> <laughs> working all day so i, I just had to come through <laughs> <laughs> appeasement is is the best way sometimes um <laughs> but anyway we'll be moving on we've got the houston rockets to talk about who are doing some strange stuff at the moment and then we'll just jump around but you know the drill uh when i'm on i just like to fly all over the place and there's there's not really any any um order to it we'll, we'll end up on tangents at some point i have no doubt i, I can't wait to for mike to to bring something up that we haven't seen all week um mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's what tends to happen. But anyway, uh, Daryl Murray and the Houston Rockets at the moment are quite literally going for broke um, after the trade deadline, which you you obviously podcasted with Tom the other week. Um, they've made some moves that have seen them acquire the likes of Robert Covington and move Clint Capella out. Um, this is the Rockets yet again trying to to sort of change change the game and push the game to to another level by playing this sort of ultra small ball, which seems to be the phrase that's being thrown around on um, social media and stuff at the moment. I mean. Have you guys watched the Rockets since the break? They've been a hell of a lot of fun. Um, it's up, to, it, it's you know up for debate as to whether or not it will work come postseason when the game slows down a bit. But they they beat your Celtics um, yesterday night, I believe it was uh, Justin, and then obviously they they lost the Jazz a couple of nights before that by a crazy three point buzzer beater, which was you know that that should have really really happened, but. It, it's it's still in the early testing phases at the moment, and I don't know if anyone would be any one of us three anyway would be willing to um to, to you know to draw a line in the sand and say this is going to work or this isn't going to work. It's going to work. Uh, I don't know um, how well it's going to work, but it's going to work at least as well in my opinion, uh, based on a couple of different things. Uh, the most important thing I think, and this is, didn't even really have anything to do with, with the trade deadline, is how they are using Westbrook. They're they're kind of just eliminating him as a jump shooter, which is you know duh, uh, based yeah. on what you've seen in the last few years. And then when you add in um, Robert Covington, uh, who oftentimes is functioning as a center for them. Um, it was brutally effective. I hated watching all the fouls that they were goading the Celtics into when they played Boston, uh, but it was very effective. It looks very game planable. Uh, it requires a very different style of play, 
And I think that once you dial in and focus on them for a seven game series, if you are a very good team, which, you know, hopefully you are in the postseason, um, I think that there's a chance that they are a beatable team. I don't think they're going to be any kind of a world beater, but they're definitely uh, back on back on track, I guess you could say, as a serious contender. I was really getting kind of wishy-washy on them before this deal. Yeah, and that's why the the loss to the Jazz the other night was was a big one in terms of the sort of the end of season standings because that could come back to haunt them. But you know, you make this move to try and rejuvenate your season, really, and we've we've seen it across the league. Other teams like the Jazz have made moves to try and sort of bump up their um their sort of you know from now until the end of the the regular season run. And yeah, you're right. It it, it plays to the strengths of their two superstars, and you end up with someone like Russell Westbrook who is not a great three-point shooter. Now all he has to do is sort of drive inside, you know, score layups, try and get to the paint and, you know, draw fouls all the time. And that's what that's what he's good at. And then if he wants to, he can kick it out to somebody like James Harden or PJ Tucker who are, you know, very effective three-point shooters. And the the Rockets have consistently tried to, to change the game the last few years. They, they, they did it when they signed Ryan Anderson to that massive contract and everyone was like, well, hang on, what's going on here? But he was actually very good at doing one thing um and now you partner sort of russell westbrook who is incredible at driving to the to the rim and you partner him with someone like james harden who is just got a you know i think mike d'antoni said it recently like the most incredible all-round game and yeah it's it's a lot of fun watching the rockets at the moment and people are going on about the fact they don't have a lack of size but i don't know who said it but i'm sure i read a quote somewhere once about it's it's not the the size that matters when it comes to rebounding it's it's the he- the heart and the hustle and They've been they've been doing that so far. I mean, the Celtics the other night. You look at the split across the board. Multiple players with two, three, four, five, six. You know, even up to ten rebounds in some cases. And in the games they've won, they have been all over the place and done their best to try and, you know, cause disruption on both ends. And it's strange to see it, but it, weirdly it's working. And Covington gives them a great edge in that area. <laughs> I, I've gone from not wanting to watch them at all to having to watch every <laughs> single minute of it. Um, you brought up an interesting point there about rebounds. I think we're overrating rebounds completely. <laughs> and I think this is what... You know, and I think we've just overvalued them because we're so used to them being part of the high-level box score we look at. We look at the points, the rebounds, and assists. Yeah. Um, who's leading the league in rebounds at the minute? It's uh... Andre Drummond. He's just been traded for traded to the a caps, bag of half-eaten yeah. peanuts and some belly button fluff. Yeah, then, then you've got Rudy Gobert, who as, isn't as insular and, and uh, as as um, Drummond is in terms of his play on the court. He can do more. He's a defensive present. Then you've got Hassan Whiteside, and then you've got Clint Capella, who's just been traded. These are all specialist role players. The, the, yeah. the value of a rebounding player now has just depreciated massively with the way this game's gone like it used to be a role way where someone like Dennis Rodman for example who was an incredible rebounder made it an art form he would survive in the league because of that he didn't bring any offensive game he didn't need to but yeah. this is the thing of the past now and, and the cost of having a rebounder is reduced spacing on offense lower efficiency shots in the paint so it's massively outweighed by the potential rewards I love the fact that Maury caught you know Maybe it's like a, a, a what's it called? Like a death howl or whatever it is from, from Maury and D'Antoni <laughs> in, in Houston. Who knows? But they've just gone right to the precipice of being the team that are ahead of the curve again. I think um, Kurt Goldsbury, who we often comment on on here, came out with a tweet today that by 2025, the NBA will be shooting more than half its points from three as, a, as an average, which the Rockets oh, are already man. doing that over these last four games. It's so crazy. It's to, to mad. Think, to think that it all comes back from like the Antonio spell with the the seven seconds or less Suns as well, where it, you know they they had the possibility to to push it further and push it to the edge of the envelope, but they had so many critics back when they were doing what they were doing in like two thousand six, seven, eight that they ended up kind of reining themselves in a bit. And you know they yeah. had Amare Stoudemire who could guard the five and could could take you outside if he wanted to, but. It's strange because obviously Clint Capella goes the other way. He's not a bad player by any stretch of the imagination, but unfortunately due to his size and his sort of lack of mobility, he is a liability these days. And we we saw it in the postseason last year, and we have seen it with more and more players recently. Andre Drummond is is one of those guys as well. And unless you are, you know, the very 
pinnacle of sort of a modern four or five. So you're, you're Anthony Davis, for mm-hmm. example. You know, he can he can keep up with the guards, but he's also mobile enough and effective enough to do what he needs to do everywhere else on the court. Whereas guys like Drummond and you know some of the other players around the league, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, someone like Aaron Baines, like they're they're not those guys. And by removing them from the team completely, you end up with increased spacing, which opens up the court for you know, f- five three-point shooters on your team effectively. And then if you've got someone like Russell Westbrook, who is as good as he is at, you know, putting his head down and just going for it, you end up with m- even more space on the perimeter because you are effectively negating the advantage that the other team has with those those big players because they can't get out and do anything unless it is, you know, Anthony Davis. But that doesn't seem to matter because Anthony Davis didn't do too well against them the other week. And then uh, Russ dunked all over Rudy Gobert the other night. So... <laughs> I mean, it's a small sample of size, but it is fascinating. They're what two and two at the minute. It's really fun. Like but, it's given it's given the NBA community something to sort of you know argue around and look at and and study. And at this point of the season, we really needed it because a lot of people were kind of flagging. <laughs> yeah, and but there's so it's just fantastic to watch because there's so much space in the middle that the minute they they curl past their um, defender from the outside, there is just so much room, and they've got that extra half second or two where you would expect the big man to be rotating from the low block where there isn't one now and it's just it's just you were getting to see some amazing Westbrook layups he's just like it must be this it's basically a free-for-all for him he's he's just like a piranha at the leg of lamb or something it's just mad one of the weird things is as well is Russ is what 31 now and we've 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 thought we'd seen like the most athletic scary form of Russell Westbrook ever but in this system with a teammate that you know like James Harden and the players around him and the organization around them that <laughs> he might be coming up to play like a, some of his best basketball like I know he was phenomenal for those years in in Oklahoma playing with Durant and weirdly enough James Harden but in this system with the way the modern NBA uh, NBA is at the moment to do what he's doing and average the stupid figures he's been averaging the last four or five games is it's phenomenally impressive, but when it comes to the postseason, we'll have to see if it if it works out. But I, I gather just from what you're saying is that you probably think it's going to run really well up until the playoffs, and then it might slow down, and then they might start seeing some some serious problems. Well, they were struggling for a bit. Uh, I, Harden was actually having some really bad shooting performances for a while. Yeah, and this this seems to have snapped that. But it, it's in you know one of the things that is in my mind is if you can find a way to keep Russ from going downhill, then you you really take away one of the biggest advantages they have to setting up their offense in the first place. So things like that, I think you know, I'll just off the top of my head, those are a really good counters because. As we've been saying, one of the key things to their success has been reducing his role to not having to be a shooter. He's surrounded by other shooters. He's, all, he's almost their center in some ways because even Rocco can shoot. Um, it's yeah. really it's, – it's almost completely backwards the way, the way that these people are doing these <laughs> things. And it's, it's just fascinating to watch. But I, I think it's also eminently addressable with some planning. I think it's very good um, personnel management from the Rockets because they've seen that Russ doesn't work off the ball. Yeah. And this is a way of getting him on the ball more often, which during the season reduces the load for Harden, which I think is one of the primary reasons he's had a slump. It's because he struggled to carry this high usage and continue at the the ridiculous scoring rate he was. And well, this and is he, a way... he's hit a roadblock every postseason as well. Like, exactly because he's been doing too much. <laughs> and, and now we've got this 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 final stretch run of you know the last twenty eight to thirty games or whatever it's going to be, and he's got essentially he can become the off ball secondary player for this and hopefully mm. you know his minutes are down he his usage is down and that's great for him because it's allowing him to rest without him having to actually sit games he could then in theory by the time the playoffs come have recuperated some of that earlier season energy and they get ready to flip it again so i wonder how malleable it'll be when they switch back to you know harden being the real focal point um i get that he still is the predominant player in this but you know what i mean if if they have to reduce westbrook's role a bit i wonder i wonder how that all sort of plays together in terms of game planning for it it's going to be really interesting because you've got to make the decision whether you play them the way they play in which yeah. case you're already being taken out of your game plan or whether you stick with what you've got and you know so someone like the jazz who who have had fun with them in the past? It's going to be interesting to see whether someone like Gobert can stay on the floor in a playoff series, or whether his his you know 
as great a defender as he is, he's not the most mobile. Um, and I can't see him being stretched out to the three and having to to recover as quickly as you know as someone six inches shorter can uh, to get to get in and help try and protect that paint. Because yeah. once once Russ has turned that corner, good luck catching him. It's also a case of if you are one of these teams, like you mentioned, the Jazz, like have they got a good enough perimeter defender there who can keep up with someone like Russ and go out and guard him? Because like from what we've seen from Mike Conley so far this season, he's probably not quite at the period at the you know where he was you know five or six years ago where he could go out and do that. But I'd, I'm I'm not even sure you could rely on him or someone like Donovan Mitchell. Like Donovan Mitchell's an okay defender. But you need more than one, though. You, yeah, you're going to need more than one, and you, yeah, you're going to get the switches, and you're going to get the blitz. The, do you blitz these guys or not? Because you look at like the Atlanta Hawks, and the, their entire offense runs around Trey Young, and teams are blitzing him, but he's working out ways of getting around it. Devin Booker as well. Devin Booker is remarkably good at getting around that, and it all stems back to what we were saying a few minutes ago about D'Antoni and changing the game, like. Everyone used to complain that Steve Nash had the ball too much. And now you look around the league and there are certain players on certain teams who are, you know, undeniably the best players on their rosters and they have the ball all the time. But we shouldn't be criticising them for it because, if let's be honest, you kind of want the ball in your best player's hands most of the time. That's why Damian Lillard has been so bloody effective like the last three or four weeks. And it's why Luke has been great because, you know, certainly in Rick Carlisle's case in Dallas, like they realized after once they let him run the offense and initiate everything, they were a lot better team. And it's all just sort of following in from, from what James Harden was doing with Houston the last few years. But now all of a sudden you've got, you know, two MVP level players to, to be worrying about. And it's going to be difficult for some of these teams, I think, to, to adjust to that the weird thing for the thing for me was like when this trade was made i thought oh that's strange and i thought something else was coming i thought they'd go and try and get a cheap center they didn't, or, you they didn't, know, they didn't get dj no and you, you were expecting them to bring in somebody who's going to have some form of decent impact and somebody who could play a key role for them come the postseason but if if their small ball super small ball is going to work the, as well as it's kind of worked so far you i think they're going to run with it for the seven games and see how how see how the other team gets on I wouldn't be surprised if they still try to pick up a buyout guy, but at least yeah. from now, I think they're just going to see how it works. And I think a lot of buyout guys are not necessarily pushing as hard to get bought out um, because, you know, they have time and it'll give you a better idea of what team you want to go to. Is Houston the team that you want to be on if they're only going to use you for two minutes a game? I desperately hope they don't sign anyone. I want them to go, you know, they say there's a fine line between genius and madness, and I want them to just <laughs> drunkenly stumble either way over that line like some weird kind of basketball sobriety test. Absolutely. Just just push it to the max. Yeah. I just, I, I just want to see this in full force. I want, I want to, because, I mean, you've meant, we've mentioned D'Antoni and the Suns. Um, they were ahead of the time. They were pushing the edge. Before that, you had like Don Nelson and the Mavericks. They didn't win but they always pushed the envelope far enough that someone was able to come and and take up the mantle and and use that in a better way. And it's going to be intriguing to see if this is like the next phase of where basketball goes, just exactly how um, how it how it sort of speeds up the transition throughout the week. league. We know it's a copycat league. It's going to be interesting to see how all these incredibly high usage ball dominant creators that we see as the stars the, in this era are now pushed even further to become the, the the focal point with lots of room to move and lots of room to get inside and it's kind of just another nail in the coffin of the big man really yeah which has been coming for well for certainly three or four years now and if not longer but yeah they got they got rid of the vote for the all-star in 2011 didn't they it's yeah it's almost a decade ago <laughs> Oh god, the All Star Game! I don't care. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I won't bring it up again. I won't bring it up again. You, you brought it up, didn't you? You had to mention it. Um, but but uh, speaking of teams that don't actually have superstars, the Toronto Raptors uh, they were on a 15 game win streak, which came to an end in Brooklyn last night after Caris Levert went off on them. Um, they looked they they looked poor last night. The Raptors actually, which was shocking considering everything. But after that. Um, that that video you sent me earlier, Mike, where um, OG was talking about how he's ever won fifteen <laughs> things in a row in his life, and he said Connect Four. I'll see if I can find. It. Well, I'll clip, I'll clip it in at some point, but it was. Uh, it I, was I almost played it, it in the opening, but it was seventeen seconds long, so I. 
It was too long. It's not going to be a <laughs> De offense. I'm not playing it. Ah, oh, it was great, but yeah, the Raptors' uh, 15 win the game uh, game win streak is actually the longest uh, win streak in Canadian professional sports, which is quite impressive considering they have they have some pretty damn good hockey teams up in Canada. But yeah, to 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 do what they've been doing, you know, after Kawhi Leonard left and after Danny Green left, and to just sort of not do too much like they added guys you know like Rondé Hollis Jefferson who was a good player in Brooklyn um coming into this lineup and just fitting in and then they've they've had all this extra energy from guys like Chris Boucher and and Terrence Davis who Terrence Davis especially he's just looking like one of those guys who he's a lottery steal like he's the Fred Van Vliet of of this past year for the Raptors and they just keep making it work and Every week we hear all this crap about Masai Ujiri going somewhere else and with everything that's going on right now and how well they're playing, I, I'm sorry, but why would you leave this situation? This is a team that has given you an organization that has given you everything and you're getting it on the court from all of these guys each and every night. They are such a fantastic team. Um, and we don't really get to say that very often anymore because it's all about, it's all about superstars these days, but you have a team that is really playing with heart. And yeah, it's a shame that their win streak comes to an end just before the All-Star break. Um, but how impressed have you been by the Raptors so far this season? I mean, second in the Eastern Conference says Coach it all. of the year. There is absolutely no doubt that Nick Nurse should be getting that award. I mean, he's got people who I can't even tell you who they are because I can't remember their names because I've never heard of them before. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're, they're scoring double digits. I mean, not last night, but... Um, they're, they're, they're scoring consistently as, as contributing players, even though they, they might as well have just walked off of a G League team. I mean, this guy is getting production out of, yeah. out of people on a level that is like, you know, very Miami-esque. Yeah, I, it's it's mad. The drop-off that was expected at the start of the season to have that much pride and commitment and willingness to, to come back and, and fight to retain your crown after your star player walks away. I mean, we knew they were going to be a good team. Yeah. Because they were good last year when Kawhi sat. But and they've got some great players on the roster as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. Marcus Gasol and Ibaka. And... And, and as much as it is a superstar league, as, we, as I said, what, not five minutes ago, you don't win it on your own. And they've had guys step up and, and, and fill voids. It's just... I mean, I, I, I think they're overachieving. I don't know how long they're going <laughs> to... I mean, that's an easy take I guess but I don't know how long they can sustain it for I didn't expect them to sustain it for this long it's just uh, it's just fantastic yeah I have no idea what to make of them when it comes to playoffs and when you probably will need that star to get you somewhere but mm -hmm. with like the way OG's been playing defensively you can probably count on them to lock some teams down um, and they've ma the best the best thing about them is they've managed to fight through injuries like pr probably every player on that roster has been injured at some point this season yet they've still managed to win games and you know the, the Dallas Mavericks know this better than everyone they don't give up like they, mm -hmm. they've come from behind many times this year even when it's been double digits and it's looked impossible um, and with that crowd behind them and the fact that they are still the reigning NBA champions like uh, we, we shouldn't really be counting them out and I feel a bit bad that we, we kind of misjudged them at the start of the season but you know they, they lost a key a core piece of that team and arguably the guy who dragged them through the postseason but with the players that are on that roster and the experience that's on that roster the young team the young guys that have come around it I, I, I they, they could go pretty far again and, and that's that's saying a lot and the fact that they are beating some of these teams so easily like and I know I know it doesn't really count, but like they they smashed the Bulls the other night, and they they've yeah beaten, that doesn't they, count. They, they, no, that doesn't count. They've, they've Neither do the like, Wizards. They've beaten the Sixers and some of the other teams that are supposed to be right up there with them, and obviously they've got their own problems, which we won't go into on this podcast. But um, yeah, I, the, the Raptors have been so incredibly impressive, and it, it's just nice to see one of the sort of the darlings of the league doing well. <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> the darlings of the league. I mean, I mean, they have beat some. Terrible teams in that run, as as good as but that run was. Conference. But um, but yeah, well, <laughs> Wizards, Timberwolves, Hawks, Knicks, Spurs, uh, Spurs, yeah, okay, Hawks, Cavs, <laughs> Pistons, I can Bulls, hear Hugh Hopkins banging it, banging yeah. something right now. <laughs> Timberwolves again. So they they haven't, you know, it's not a fifteen. Get, not, I'm not taking away from them. Fifteen games is is an impressive run in a professional league, but I I don't know how much of a of a steer that gives us when it comes to playoffs because yeah. there's a lot of non-playoff teams in there. Um, they've beaten some of them quite 
quite considerably, but then they've had a couple of, of ones where they've had to squeak it out. Um, yeah, it's... I, I don't know how well they're going to fare when they haven't got the best player on the court, to be honest. I mean... Yeah, that's a massive advantage. I've seen them it? beat the Celtics. I mean, we, we, we watched them lose to the Celtics pretty handily on, I think it was Christmas Day, but just a, a week or so later, they, they beat the pants off the Celtics. So, I mean... I'm sure if we go through the schedule, mm. we can find a couple other examples of, of quality teams that they've won against. Um, oh, yeah. Of my head. And it's really hard to win 15 games in a row, even against bad teams, mm-hmm. uh, particularly with injuries. So I'm a believer. I think they're a second-round team at least. I don't know if they, they will get much further than that because of the reasons you guys point out. But I do believe that, that they are legit. I do think that, you know, that lack of superstar power – um, is a problem unless somebody like Siakam emerges or, say, Ananobi takes a big step forward between now and then. Uh, but, yeah, I, I do think they're going to make some noise in the postseason. Well, I think I think Siakam was on his way to emerging, but he, he got struck down by, you know, some injury problems. But if he can get back up to a point where he is kind of dictating the way they play, he's one of those guys that you can't account for because you don't really know what you're going to get from him. Um, well, he was in the running for MVP conversations yeah. <laughs> at the start of the season. This, Yeah, they've... And yeah, they have dealt with, you know, significant injuries to significant contributors and they've just rolled with it and gone next man up style. And it is, it is great to watch. But as as Justin says, sec, second round sort of the limit I can see on it. Yeah. I, w- I saw some one of the highlights from one of the games the other week, and they had Rondé Hollis Jefferson at the five, which really threw me off. So th- they've clearly managed to just sort of work something out there and you know push through. But I guess it's the modern NBA is just stick any go. player, where, stick, any, stick any player wherever you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of sticking any players wherever you want, uh, Jordan Clarkson's performances with the Jazz is just something I want to touch upon. Um, Mike, you will certainly know this because we've been podcasting for however many years. Big fan of the Jazz, love watching the Jazz, mm-hmm. and the, the, they were they were in a real slump at uh, the sort of the first half of this year. Certainly up until they made the Clarkson trade, and it, it didn't. Traditionally, the Jazz have been one of those teams that have started poorly. The last two or three seasons, they've started poorly, and then they've worked their way out of it. But it didn't. There was something not quite right, and whether it was the the sort of I don't know the lack of communication between Mike Conley and some of the other guys in that team, or just the injury problems he was overcoming himself. And the expectations that were thrown on this team at the start of the season, this this move has, has changed everything for them. And he's I, I've got an article coming out on the website at some point, probably today or tomorrow, whenever whenever it gets edited and whenever this pod goes <laughs> up. But um, he's absolutely playing the best basketball of of his career right now. I mean, I'm a Lakers fan. When we drafted him, we weren't expecting too much from him. Um, came in and was a very good role player in what was a pretty difficult situation because you had someone like D'Angelo Russell taking up a lot of the minutes and everywhere he's been, he's just had to fit in. He had Colin Sexton in front of him after LeBron and everybody left in Cleveland. Um, and this is a guy who's never, you know, never really started games. He's always tended to come off benches. Most seasons he hasn't started at all, in fact. Um, and the way he's been playing over the last sort of 24 games is is just... You know, it's it's fantastic to see, and the the Jazz are really reaping the benefits of a guy who just knows his role. Like he is, you could I'd put him down as a candidate for sixth man of the year at the moment. Like he's been playing that well, and he's been that had that significant an impact on the way this, you know, this Jazz team has performed, and this bench has suddenly just sprung into life because some of the other guys in that roster have, have suddenly started playing well as well. He he has been fantastic in this role coming off the bench. 6'4", he's a spark plug. He he's just plugged and played really well into that that Utah system. Um when they lose some of the dynam the like the dynastic uh nature of Mitchell when he's either sitting or you know he's gone through these recent struggles, he's a yeah. guy who can just come in and give them scoring. Um He's kind of what they needed last year as well when when Mitchell was essentially having to carry the load on his own. And if Mitchell didn't score, this team lost because, you know, there was there were periods when Jingles was in a slump um, and they just didn't have a secondary scorer. And that was supposed to be Bogdanovich. And I'm not and, and it clearly is he is there scoring as well. But he it, it you kind of feel that if Clarkson had been there last year, he would have possibly even more been more successful than he is now. Yeah. But definitely. his 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 splits are a fantastic like his his points per shot attempt he's in the 92nd percentile which means that he's just money and he's he doesn't he can create his own shot but he plays off the ball as well like 40 percent of his of his buckets are assisted so this is a guy who just seems to be clicking in the in this system it's it's i'm very pleased for him because you know 
two and a half seasons or two seasons roughly in Cleveland. <laughs> Glad to be yeah, out there. Uh, I mean, that first year he obviously went to the finals with LeBron, which they lost to the to the um, Warriors. But <laughs> I remember that first game for the for the Cavs that he, he played in, and they I think well I think it was against the Celtics. I might be wrong, um, but he came out and had a big performance, and everyone was like, "Oh my God, look how good the Cavs are now!" and that didn't quite last, like, and they got to the finals and lost. But all of last year, it was you, Cleveland had no direction. Arguably, still have no direction now. Um, <laughs> but, but coming into this role and this situation, and it's made guys like Tony Bradley and and you know Emmanuel Moody, I play better because they've realised that you know that, that they can't just take the night off. And uh, you know Jordan Clarkson has gone in there and proved to them that they've done they've done that. And it's weird because the roster that was put together at the start of the season, and you mentioned Bogdanovich, like they didn't have to worry about just going to Mitchell offensively anymore. They had other guys. They had Mike Conley. They had Bogdanovich. They had Mitchell. So there's three really good offensive options there. But it just wasn't working throughout the first 24, 25 games of this season. Um, so you bring in a guy like Jordan Clarkson. He's still relatively young. You know, he was drafted in 2014. Um, but he's got some good yeah, experience with him. Um, he's He played with Kobe Bryant at the end of his career. And he's played with LeBron James like... He's been around some of the greatest players to have ever played the game, and I'm sure he's learned a lot from from the, his time with those guys. And now he's in a situation where everyone loves him, like Donovan Mitchell, and the guys seem to have really just taken him under their wing and you know fitted him into that team. Um, and it's it's a great place to be because there's no distractions in Utah. You know, there's nothing you can go out and get <laughs> caught doing or or anything. So I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's. I'm sure we've mentioned this on the really... pod before, wasn't it? Was it Tony Parker who said the only thing that's open past ten o'clock at night is a subway? <laughs> 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 Well, yeah, and, and there's a really cute interview on uh, from the game last night where that they beat the Miami Heat actually, and they were they're playing well themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was talking to the the journalist, and the journalist was like, "So, what are you doing for the All Star break?" And he was just like, "I'm just going to go home, hang out with my daughter, you know, chill out." And going back five or six you know when he was drafted with the lakers and stuff you'd have never pictured him just being that sort of mature about everything and, and i guess i guess that's what happens when you grow up but <laughs> yeah once you have kids you can't play for the lakers basically <laughs> <laughs> you need to get out of la lebron's breaking a lot of rules uh, right now yeah then. lebron's lebron is the the exception that disproves the rule so let's take a quick break to talk about our friends at mbastore.eu, Europe's official online MBA store. We've teamed up with them to give you 15% off orders using our code DCPOD15. It's All-Star Weekend, so you know what that means. Loads more jerseys and gear to get your hands on. Team LeBron, Team Yanis, Team World and Team USA jerseys. All fresh in, all ready right now. Whatever you need, go get it at mbastore.eu. Just make sure you remember DCPOD15 at checkout. But there's more with... All-Star 2020 warm-up jackets, team shorts, hoodies, and t-shirts. NBA Store.eu has you covered like the Booker stepping into Damian Lillard's All-Star spots quicker than a catch-and-shoot <laughs> buzzer beater. Ah, oh, man, that's good. Uh, offer excludes sale and clearance items, but what are you waiting for? Head on over to NBA Store.eu now and use the code DCPOD15 for 15% off your purchases. Anyway, back to the podcast. Okie dokie, so... This is a strange one. We're going to talk about uh, team valuations, which came out on Forbes this week. It was an article that I noticed while I was at work, probably when I was supposed to be doing work, but, you know, stuff happens. Um, <laughs> ball is ball- life. <laughs> <laughs> ball, 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 ball is life. Yeah, Forbes counts. It's financial. I'll just, yeah. I'll just blame that. Um, but Do you, know, anyway- you send this to me every year. It's one of my, it's one of my favorite articles <laughs> to look forward to every year. And sure enough, I just get either, you know, a Slack message or a WhatsApp from you with, with the link to it every, the every season. Article. Get yep. ready. Woo. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yet again, the NBA is is on the rise, which isn't really surprising. Certainly since I've been doing this podcast, it's been one of those sports that's just grown and grown in popularity and more and more normal people who never used to give a crap are now talking about it. Are you claiming um, responsibility for the unprecedented growth no, of the NBA? I, I, I am not claiming responsibility <laughs> at all. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're playing a small part of that in this, this you know, over here and in the UK at least. And, and Justin's doing his thing over there in Mexico when they have the games over there. So, well, I actually wanted to talk about that because there's a little nugget buried in this article that is, I think, the most supremely important thing for the NBA period. And I'll give you a clue. I recently wrote an article about this uh, here in Mexico. Uh, any idea what I'm talking about? 
expansion? No, but you're on the right idea because with expansion, <laughs> no, seriously, it's very closely related. Um, with expansion comes the issue of how we're going to see these teams here in Mexico because yeah. we do have League Pass, but a lot of people, you know, they don't have access to the internet. So, you know, making sure the streaming aspect of, of League Pass or whatever they end up doing after this next round of TV uh, broadcast rates deals are signed is going to be hmm. not just crucial for the expansion in uh, into Latin America, but around the world, because that's the situation in like a lot of different parts of the world where people don't necessarily have a really good um, internet infrastructure and the primary consumption for any kind of video is through their cell phones because they can't afford computers. So if you want to get more eyeballs on your product, then streaming must, absolutely must be a central focus of these deals going forward. And I got a little tidbits. If you go back and, and check out that article, there's some tidbits in there that um, Raul Zaraga, the, the head of NBA Mexico, um, he, he mentioned that there is something in the works. He wouldn't talk about it too much. But I, I strongly suspect that our, our analyst from this article is spot on with their analysis that this, this streaming thing is going to be a massive influx of cash into the league. And we remember what happened last time in terms of competitive balance when we had a massive influx of power. Evan Turner. Evan Turner. <laughs> oh, damn you for mentioning his contract. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I had to get it in there. But yeah, yet again, the New York Knicks are the highest uh, valued franchise in the NBA. The Lakers and the Warriors joined them in the... Uh, the four billion club, which is an insane number to talk about. Um, a lot of this still pales in comparison to the major sport league, you know, to the NFL. I was going to say major sport league then, but you know, the NBA is a major sport league. But um, certainly internationally at the moment, you've got the Premier League, which is obviously one of our fine, uh, finest exports, and then you've got the NBA, uh, the two, you know, basketball, football, two of the biggest sports, two of the, the two, they're, they're, they are. Sorry, I use my words at some point tonight. Um, they are the biggest sports on the planet right now, and the the growth is is not surprising and with a digital age and people being able to use that thing called tiktok and youtube and stuff to, to watch <laughs> highlights even if it's just watching steph curry taking three-point shots like it's all engagement and it's something that some of the other sort of american sports leagues haven't been too great um to jump on whereas the nba has always been at the forefront of that and i think you see that in some of the sort of the charts that are on this forbes article actually um we'll link it in the show description if you want to go and check it out but certainly since 2013 um the rise in sort of you know media wealth from the sport and from like the international growth that they're getting as well from the players that are coming across has helped tremendously and even now we're looking around like some of the best players in the league are you know it's Jokic it's Luka there's and even going back 10 years you, you probably couldn't say there was as many great European players as there are in the league now and the game has changed an awful lot since since 2010 um, financially and on the court and I think this this sort of article kind of you know signifies that but it's it's impressive to see that the nba despite the apparent troubles that it was supposedly having this year you know tv ratings were supposed to be down and there's been a lot of injuries which i know mike you've brought up on several podcasts so far this year and you had the dawa mori tweet at the start of the season which we've discussed um we thought was going to have a pretty pretty negative impact on the nba but they've sort of you know ridden that that turmoil for now um obviously we'll have to see what happens because a lot of those financial implications probably won't come in until next year um, well, but, yeah. not even that, because the uh, the ten cent deal for which again is mentioned in the good, article, yeah, one point five billion was signed last summer. So I'm <laughs> assuming that's more than a single year agreement. If there's one point five billion being thrown at it, it'll be interesting to see. Well, the cap has shrunk too. I mean, they have they have lowered yeah. the cap by about I think a million dollars based on just just very you know tangential stuff that is immediate rather than this other stuff. So yeah, it's going to be very interesting. We're- there, there were some really interesting points in it because it is a really positive article. Yeah, but then definitely. we have got these things that are floating around in the background, like the reduced cap, like the potential for long-term issues with China. Uh, well, the, the, the amount of injuries that have been this season have, have impacted, you would have thought would have impacted gate receipts, but apparently so far they're up 8%. Um, mainly due to the the, the Warriors selling a, an absolute ton of season tickets at the the new uh, arena, brand new, brand new arena, with no, which no, no, no stars none of the superstars it, yeah. have played in. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
it, the, some some of the big things that stood out for me was uh, well the number one reason why James Dolan will never sell the Knicks uh, because for the fifth <laughs> straight year that much num- money. <laughs> yeah and it's up fifteen percent uh, yeah there was that the fact that OKC were the only loan team to have an operating loss last season and that was because they had a sixty one million dollar lu- luxury tax bill <laughs> um, which they never used to want to pay. No, cough, James Harden, um, cough. and then yeah, the the, the stream in how it was up by thirty percent on last season. And I, I, I wish they would, I wish they would allow us to see more into these stats to understand where these came from. Because um, mm. so obviously you can, you can tweak things and and skew the angle you're looking at them to say, to say what you want. But you know, if street streaming is going to be the future, absolutely. And even this week, we've seen incredibly slow on the uptake the premier league are talking about doing their own sort of yeah. league pass thing uh which how long, how long have you had league pass now matt oh god god knows Ten close years, to a decade Ten years at yeah. least <laughs> so yeah it's it's just it's just mad that the the well essentially is that the world's richest league the premier league i don't i don't know i don't f- I believe it is i remember it may not be now but i remember doing a story i think for for us uh, not that long ago maybe about a year ago um about Something, something about the, the, the valuation of the different leagues, and I, I do believe that they are the, the most valuable league in the world. Yeah. So, and it's taken them ten years to get ten years to get on board with with this idea of you know yeah. bypassing a broadcaster and and streaming it yourself. That's you know that that could be a huge revenue stream from them. But that's you know sort of the limit of my interest in football. To be honest, is just the <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the Premier League had has has had that, but there's also this weird thing in football where it's, they, they, it's there's like relig- three p.m. is like this religious slot in the world of football in in England certainly and th- their argument was that if you streamed the games the 3 p.m. games then your gate sales and stuff would go down and i generally don't think that would be the case because the argument is live sports remains live sports you want to say i was there you know when there's a wimbledon final you you'd rather be there watching it rather than watching it on telly like certainly if you like tennis but you know you it That's always weird. comes down it always comes down to the argument you would you'd rather be at the event as it's happening than sit there and watch it on TV in my opinion yeah so what so the argument is people won't go to the three o'clock game if they can watch it live the, one of one of the one of the very What's the lame point and in all these sports packages then that, yes can they, can they not watch it on the sports packages with sky and bt and whatever there's no 3 p.m. kickoffs on tv what? Okay, that's <laughs> what? That's do you know what they need to do? They need to get some like you know how in the states uh, the the Regional local providers. stations yeah, yeah. get the the games and then they geo block them per state. Wouldn't it be yeah. mad if they could geo block them within a certain radius of of the the city? Yeah, that's no, just it, a, that's, it's, tan- it's, that's a tangent. It's absolutely nuts. Sky Sports and BT pay an awful lot of money for Premier League rights every year, and that only includes lunchtime kickoffs. And the evening sort of. So do late, any of the big teams games. play at three p.m.? Yeah, Man United. Like a lot of the teams will, they will switch each week, and you'll have Man City playing on a three p.m. on one day, and that won't be on telly. That's why match of the day is is such a big thing over here, is because uh, <laughs> Justin's probably sitting there going, "What's match of the day?" Um, match of the day is like a highlight show where they bring together all of the clips from the games, and that's that has traditionally, until recently, been the only way you could watch some of those three p.m. kickoffs. Whereas now. The Premier League have realised, oh shit, people are using YouTube and po- uploading these goals straight to you know Vine and whatever it is that everybody's using. Like they've they've caught on and suddenly realised that. And Sky now actually do upload the goals. Like after the goals go in and after the games finish, they will upload the goals from the game straight to YouTube for people to watch. But in the past, there's been massive barriers and very stern defences against losing sort of the the I don't know the religious aspect of how brilliant the 3 p.m. kickoff slot is <laughs> yeah, the bigger the barrier the more the pirate yeah exactly and i think in the modern age there's no way that the premier league could get around it so and i think in the states they've had some sort of premier league pass for a while or well, you've at least been able to watch a lot more games than you can watch over here you can watch 3 p.m. games in the states you can't watch them here though mike <laughs> i don't watch them here well, I, I don't watch any of the yeah, games yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Mike was last watching football when it was black and white. Yeah, well, de- I definitely remember uh, Des Lynham being the host of Match of the Day. <laughs> oh, wow. That is going back a bit. Um, but yeah, no, these financial evaluations just the, the, every year they come out and the, 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 they make the, you know, they put the league in a positive light, even though there is probably negative news that appears 
beforehand and some of the teams that you wouldn't expect to be worth quite a lot of money are worth an awful lot of money and yeah it just puts sort of the sale of the Clippers and stuff into perspective really when you think of the growth from some of these teams in the last few years and like the money that um, Alibaba have put into buying the Nets and then they've mm-hmm. bought out the arena as well like it's there's crazy dollars floating around and yeah strange strange time to to be watching the NBA grow yeah really it really is it's uh, it's a good time though it's good. It is a good, time. a good time. I think what we've seen over here is like certainly amongst the younger people as well is they are a lot more engaged in the NBA. It's obviously one of the things the article gets into actually is like comparing the different age groups of who watches different the different sports leagues in the states and you you know older people tend to watch the NFL and baseball and then like you go down to sort of the sixteen year olds up to you know mid twenties or whatever and the NBA is winning that by a long a long mile. Um, and I think a lot of that is all down to sort of the, the ease of use and how, you know, easy you can just watch games and access highlights and stuff these days. It's 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 literally the perfect sport for for the modern era, um, which is why I'm constantly telling my friends that I don't care about football anymore. Um, <laughs> but anyway, moving on to the All-Star game, which is something else that I don't care about. I'm going to let Mike talk to you about this one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's All-Star weekend, obviously, so... Um... You know, the, oh, yeah, the there's other stuff that happens. I forgot about that. There was other stuff that happened? What do you mean? What, as in, like, the changes to the rules? Yeah, All-Star Weekend, the other yeah. stuff. You know, they do other yeah. things other than the dunk contest. Green balls yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. and something. <laughs> I just, I don't care. I yeah. do not care. I'm only interested to see this new <laughs> format that's Kobe-inspired. That, I think, is kind of interesting. But... Yeah, that's, so, that's so cool. for those who don't know, essentially the first three quarters of the game are individual games where there is a financial prize on the line for charity. So Team Yanis versus Team LeBron, quarter one, whoever wins that wins the money. Quarter two, scores rest- uh, reset to zero, same again. Quarter three, same again. Then at quarter four, all those scores that have been reset are added up. So you'll have, for example, Team LeBron 110, Team Yanis 112. Then the NBA is going to add 24 on top of the 112, so it'd be 120, 136, because um, that's and that's part of the Kobe tribute. Um, and then, rather than playing to a 12 minute clock, they will play until one or team or the other hits that plus 24 on the on the third quarter score, which is kind of funky because it means we'll end with a we have to end with a game winning shot. Yeah, but I got I I, I don't know what the NBA could have done because it it needed it needs life breathing into it i'm not sure this is the fix but i'm also not sure what else they could have done i'm into it i'm into experimentation like experimentation with rules experimentation with format some of which can be used in games other obviously cannot um like this is obviously way too radical to ever expect an nba game to look like this like a regular or postseason game but i still i I still like the idea, and I think they should do stuff like this every year. They should just keep tinkering with it and never keep it the same, just to keep us on our toes. Have a have. A, I mean, there was a whole day where I was like, "What's going on with this thing?" Just like to to <laughs> <laughs> everyone was talking about this bizarre new format. And admittedly, once we actually sat down and read it carefully, it's not that difficult. But it sat, it looked like a Rubik's cube when we first started like becoming aware of it. See, I, I would I, the, the the way I look at it in, is how do you incentivize the players to play? And the only things I keep coming back is putting more money in their pockets. And people are like, oh, they're already paid, you know, millions of dollars to play basketball. I was like, yeah, they're, they're paid millions of dollars to play for a franchise, not to play in this game. So what what interest have they got in it? Yeah, they, they and they need to in the next CBA or something just carve out a small like half, a, not even half a percent of of basketball related income and put it aside and say, look, if your guys win, you know the all-star weekend you can give them a salary tax-free bump on their salary for the next season or something just i'm trying to get creative with the cap like that you know? against the cap so the team doesn't have to worry about changing anything they just get money yeah and then for work that they're doing because it is work i mean right now they're just doing it for yeah. free yeah exactly um but it's yeah i i'm i am intrigued to see how this works uh yeah i i i I don't know what else to say other than that. It's it's going to be interesting, and I look forward to Monday's either you know ha- articles either hailing it in glory <laughs> or hailing it in some kind of fecal matter. One thing I did want to talk about 
uh, is the snubs. Now, we've already seen one of the biggest snubs ad- addressed through uh, the commentary and the commercial. The injury, exactly. yeah. Uh, Damian Lillard is going to have to sell. He will still perform as Dame Bingala. Uh, so we'll still see him. <laughs> hey, you know, he's actually, I like him. I think he's pretty solid. Uh, and I guess you don't need too much mobility to rap. So he's going to be there. We were doing it from a chair. Yeah. So. Uh, Golden Throne. Who else should have been in this All-Star game? So if, you, if you're putting someone in, I think you should be taking someone out too. Of course. So let's say someone is injured. Let's say we get one more injury. Let's say we get... Well, I, I, won't, I won't say for con- – we'll just pretend – I know they, they pulled them from conference, but let's, we'll, we'll just pretend a nameless person rather than spook someone, you know, jinx them or whatever you want to call it. Um, who, who would be the next person in if you could just fill them in from whatever conference? So I think, I think you've already mentioned one of the issues there that I bang on about a lot on this podcast is why have we still got this stupid conference rule? Just get rid of it. <laughs> get rid agree. of it. It's completely pointless. God. But the records will no See, longer be the same. Yes, that's the point. Yeah, yeah, but, it, but not even not, like, as much as I want it for the league as a whole, which I do, it's never going to happen. But in terms of, it just makes no sense for the All-Star game anymore because they don't even play on conference team. It's just, just make it the top 30 players. The top 30 players... That's it. Don't even let us have a vote on it. Just use one of your advanced analytics to determine a list on how good someone is. Like, I don't know, uh, PER, and then just do it like that. Or make an all um, vote and let them watch what they make, and maybe then they will not complain so much. Then we'll, you just want more Celtics in there, don't you? Shh. Um, well, 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 well to, to, to appease Mr. Quinn, I would actually put Justin, uh, um, sorry, Justin, I'm going to put Jalen Brown in. Um, having watched the Celtics this year, like, I know. Kemba and and Tatum and a lot of the other guys are getting an awful lot of praise, but Jalen Brown has been phenomenal this year and he's having career bests in a lot of the statistical categories and Mm -hmm. he's really shown his versatility on both ends of the court this season. So I would probably put him in there. I think you'd have a nice argument for someone like Malcolm Brogdon with the Pacers. Uh, Zach Levine could probably have been in there, even though the Bulls are terrible, but he's having a, you know, a very standout season in what is a difficult environment and, but yeah, uh, Jalen Brown for me. Yeah, I, I think Bradley Beal needs to be considered up there. I think that losing should count. Like you should, I so I think that should count against him. But then we see Trey Young voted in by the fans, and his yeah. team are horrific. So if if Trey Young's in, and I get that he's voted in, then Bradley Beal deserves to be there. He does deserve to be there in that context, but. Again, the fans would him in, and the fans did not vote Bradley Beal. I'm taking the context victory. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I will say this. The, the, the biggest argument for Bradley Beal is that he has such amazing offensive production, which he does, uh, on a team that plays no defense. And if we put Jalen Brown on the Wizards, I think we would have just absurd statistics for him. So... I don't know. That, that is my main argument. I would like to see Bradley Bill considered um, in certain contexts. Uh, but I, for me, I think that I would either have to go with someone like Brown or Brogdon, who are at least contributing to, to some winning games. Yeah. But how many guys do you want? Like, I get that. I was, to be honest, I was surprised Brogdon made it over Sabonis. And that's not to, to slight Sabonis at all, because I think what he's doing needs recognition. Um, but do, do you really need three Celtics there? We don't. I mean, really, it doesn't, it doesn't like the All Star game. In my opinion, it should just be a popularity contest. It should be a fan vote. It should not count for Hall of Fame. It should not count for Agreed. contracts. It should just be fun. All NBA. That's, mm-hmm. that's what should count for that. I, I think I'd almost prefer an All NBA game to an All Star yes. game. Um, what about what about? Yeah. What what about John Morant? He, he should be in over Trey, without a doubt. Yeah, I would agree with that. with what the, he he has single handedly escalated the Grizzlies' rebuild. Like we were looking at the Grizzlies, thinking where where on earth do they go from here? Mm-hmm. In comes Moran, had a great year, uh, you know, in college last last year. Comes into this and just he he's brilliant to watch. Like he he's fun, and there's there's not many guys in the league who are just pure raw athletic talent and and he's one of those guys at the moment and to to sit to, to have him miss out just purely because he's probably well probably because he is a rookie that seems to be the thing um it's a shame and the, you know the grizzlies have defied all expectations this season with where they are at the moment you know sitting 500 and they're sort of fighting for that eighth seed in the west 
I, I think the Grizzlies this year, solely down to him, yeah, are, are my uh, are one of my two top watched league pass teams by far, <laughs> along with Dallas. It's interesting to get other people's views on on the, the snubs and things like that. Um, yeah, if you guys other... have got opinions, let us know as well. Tweet us yeah. at Double Clutch UK. Boom. <laughs> Good plug. Uh, <laughs> is there any other All Star bits you wanted to hit? The only other thing I, I I randomly saw this probably about an hour ago was that Bleacher Report are doing this fan engagement thing in Chicago, and they've built a court that is the the bottom the actual court is see through. Uh, so it's like it's raised, it's on stilts, you can walk underneath it while people are playing. Uh, it looks really cool. I'll see if I can find some pictures and put them on the Twitter feed. But uh, yeah, they're, they're taking fan engagement um, to the next level because they're making a really big deal out of the fact that. You know, the All-Star Games back in Chicago, um, you know, 1988 was such an iconic uh, All-Star weekend for, for that city yep. and for, you know, certainly guys like Michael Jordan and and Larry Bird. And and the fact it's back there is, is one of these big things that they're making a deal out of. And you've got this fan engagement arena where there's all these kinds of... I imagine it's like the NBA Fun House or whatever it was that we had over here but probably a lot better <laughs> yeah i expect it will be a lot better uh the, and uh, the, i think that's another good thing that the the all-star weekend does is that it's not just i mean i get that it is the biggest sort of global regular season event where they just sort of pump everything into it you know all the, all yeah. the corporate partners are there it's a huge sort of uh opportunity to to get attention on the league before the, the playoffs you know start in sort of six weeks or so um but it's they do a lot of, you know, the NBA does a lot of philanthropic work with, you know, NBA cares and whatever, um, and whatever. That sounded really dismissive, having just said <laughs> NBA cares. Um, but they do a lot of work in the community for this as well. There's a lot of things going on which probably won't make it to any articles. In, I, I think things like that should be given more light. It's impressive yeah. what they're doing. Like, a, uh, Anthony Davis is out there with part of his two K, you know. Cause he was on the the cover of this year, you know. Part of part of his deal with them is is he he's helped, he's worked with them to refurbish a court, and it's his hometown, obviously. So it's a big thing for him. Um, there's loads of stuff going on, loads and loads of stuff off the court. Yeah, it's it's something that I guess if you were trying to push the the All Star Weekend away from the states and bring it somewhere else, you know, France or here or Mexico, wherever it may be, then it would be a real draw for for everybody because of those those additional aspects you get you don't just get basketball but you get all the, the glitz and the glamour of it as well so I'm, I'm not sure they'll ever they'd ever move it outside of the states because it is such a big thing but if they're going to make some changes to the to the way the nba calendar works which is what they've been discussing then you know you know it's, it's a distinct possibility um but anyway please do check out the website doubleclutch.uk plenty of articles and stuff gone up on there recently um if you haven't done so already please do go and check out all of the kobe Bryant articles that went up a lot of people put a lot of time into those so go and check those out um you can follow us on twitter at double clutch uk and if you're watching any of the games during the week if you're watching some of the sky sports uh, matchups or if you're on league pass please do use hashtag me in the uk and let us know what your your thoughts and your feelings are on the, the games you're watching uh engage with us guys i mean you can engage with me all the time i'm on twitter at matt smashed um mike where can i find you uh mike miller underscore time Justin, what about yourself? At J-U-S-T-Q-U-I-N-N-N. Fantastic. And don't forget, you can get 15% off your products from mbastore.eu using our code DCPOD15. But I've been Matt, he's been Mike, he's been Justin. We've been the Double Clutch Podcast. Um, we'll catch you at some point next week. Thank you for listening. Take care, y'all.